I like that. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to the first event of the 2018 Nashville Elvis Woo! Festival. I had to think a second. I don't write checks anymore, so I don't have to actually write the, write the number down. My name is Tom Brown. I'm the co-producer of this festival with Brian Mays, and this is the second annual Nashville Elvis Festival. Thank you. It's awkward to call it a first annual last year, so we didn't do that, but this year we're thinking we're losing. We'll say second annual. Um, and I'll be hosting all the events, uh, including the ones uh, that start tomorrow at the Franklin Theater, which is our home until Sunday morning gospel. And uh, I just wanted to remind you that the music you were hearing uh, as you came in here was all music recorded at 706 Union Avenue. Uh, and hopefully some of you know what is in the building at 706 Union Avenue. Don't embarrass yourself if you don't know. Um, but it's, it's great to have you here. We wanted to, we did this last year. We kicked off with two special events here at Paragon uh, for a couple of reasons. One reason is I wanted to do something that was small and intimate that we could all be up close and personal to, you know, to the entertainers. And uh, this year we've got a couple of great shows uh, later on tonight. Hopefully some of you have tickets to see uh, Bill Cherry in the Jungle Room sessions. Yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna go in the jungle room to see what Elvis did in the jungle room with his with his guys, the TCB band, and then uh, a gentleman that we have coming up in a, in a second. I'll tell you about. But like I said, hopefully you were you were here last year. We're glad you're here this year. Uh, those of you that are here that have bought the VIP package, um, we have packages for you, envelopes for you. Um, if you didn't print your tickets at home, we have your tickets. If you did print your tickets at home. Hopefully you brought those tickets, but if you didn't, you're okay. They'll give them to you at the box office tomorrow. But if you did uh, buy a VIP package, uh, please see Lisa in the break room, uh, which is our little after reception. She will have your name and everything in an, on an envelope, and it has your lanyard. And the important part about the package is your lanyard will get you in first tomorrow and all for all of the events at the Franklin Theater. So that's very important to get your lanyard before tomorrow. But we'll still have them available tomorrow if you forget tonight, so it's okay. I know so when, there's, when the show's over, you make a rush in there to get your poster signed by the entertainers and get your <laughs> wine and beer. I understand your priorities. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I do want to say, uh, yes, you are free to take photos. Yes, you are free to take video. But if you do me a favor, what I'd love for you not to do tonight during the show is live stream. Um, I don't mind you posting videos later on tonight of the of the songs and the show, but if you live stream, people stay at home and they don't want to come to events. Uh, so I'm just kind of like the NFL. If you didn't pay for the package, you can't watch the game, um, at least live. And like I said, the after show, we've got uh, posters to give you after after this show, and you can get those signed by by our entertainers. And we appreciate all of you guys being here for us uh, for this event. And to set the stage, like I said, I, I had that music from Sun that I wanted to play for you to kind of get you in the mood. But I started thinking about our set here and, and what we were, wanted to recreate for you was what was, what was done for the first time in 1954 at Sun Studio with Sam Phillips sitting behind the control panel when three musicians came in the room and changed history. And I wanted to talk about Memphis in 1954 and what Elvis meant to music. Uh, Sunday night here, I was invited to a screening of the new HBO documentary, The Searcher, which is gonna be premiering in April. I was put together by uh, uh, Priscilla Presley and Jerry Schilling and Tom Zimney, who's a documentarian. It's an incredible story and it really places Elvis in history in a way that he's not been respected uh, in about the last 50 years. So hopefully this documentary will change people. But one of the things that came out in that documentary was how much of an impact Elvis really had, we forget now. We don't really remember, some of us don't remember, some of us weren't here, some of us were here but we're busy. Um, but what was life like in Memphis, in the Mid-South in 1954? And I thought, I can do research, I can write little notes to myself, but I thought, no, I've got someone in town that's a friend of mine that was in Memphis in 1954 and just happened to be kind of in the music business and I thought maybe he could come talk about what it was like in Memphis and music in 1954. And I don't even have to introduce him. I'll just let, uh, I'll let the singers introduce him. <coughs> we'll edit this part out. Here comes Wayne Smartdale. And we do with the big, big music. Woo! Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> 
jingle singers. Um, <laughs> thank you. You know me well. Um, like I said, we were t we talked, we got up this morning, we, I picked him up at 7 a.m. and we went and did radio interviews this morning, so we've had a full day of it. And we were talking in the car about, about Memphis and about what it was like to, to be in that city in 1954. And if you could, just in the few minutes that we have, uh, tell them about what was going on in music before and after. Memphis was a very special place in the 1950s. I think that the decade of the 50s, in my humble opinion, which as Wayne Newton says, I do respect, was the best decade of popular music, followed by the decade of the 60s. And in the early 1950s, at WHBQ Radio, where I was doing a show called Clock Watchers, my dream job, when I was a kid growing up in Jackson, Tennessee, everybody in Jackson listened to WHBQ. We came into Jackson like a local, and they played a lot of music. So it was my dream to be on WHBQ, and my dream came true. When I got there, I did a little research, and I found out that the man who did Red Hot and Blue at night, Dewey Phillips, had been a record salesman originally downtown at a five and 10 cent store called W.T. Grant. And what he did there was sell records. He ran the record department, and he was a pretty wild guy. Gordon Lawhead, our program director at WHBQ, happened to go into W.T. Grant, and he heard Dewey Phillips vocally selling records, literally selling records by telling you how great this record was by Johnny Lee Hooker or by whomever. And he came back to WHBQ, and he went to his bosses, John Claiborne, who ran the station, and Bill Grumbles, who became my mentor. He was the sales manager. He said, this guy's got to be on the radio. Now, Memphis was very quiet in radio until they agreed to put Dewey Phillips on the air. They tested him with a one-hour show once a week. And he was so successful, he just blew them all away. So he became a nighttime jock. Red Hot and Blue, 9 to midnight every night. 60% of the audience listened to Dewey Phillips playing black music for white kids. Now in the morning on WHBQ, remember we're talking about 1953, 1954. During the daytime hours, my morning show, the midday show, Dick Covington, Covington Swanner from three to six in the afternoon, up until nine o'clock at night, we played what I call Vanilla music. We were playing Joe Stafford, Patty Page, um, who else? Eddie Fisher, Johnny Ray, all of those artists that we had come to know and love. And they were great artists. But they were slowly, we didn't realize it at the time, those of us who were working in the daytime hours, we didn't realize it. But Memphis Radio was changing. And it was changing because of two radio stations, Dewey at Night, 9 to Midnight, WHBQ, number one, and a, a, a radio station that was in Memphis that was always number one because it was programmed for black audiences. They were all, all black jocks and all black music. They were always number one. So music was changing. And uh, it was during this period of time when Dewey was getting hot as a firecracker. Every night he would come on the air and just, I mean, everybody. If you didn't listen to Dewey Phillips at night, you weren't part of the in crowd. And uh, he played things like, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, The Crows, one of the first R&B records ever made. Uh, the Penguins, Earth Angel, remember that? Uh, the Drifters, uh, John Lee Hooker. All these records that, that white kids were listening to rather than listening to us during the daytime hours playing our vanilla music. 
and it got more and more and more popular at night. And so Dewey, one night, I was doing his show. It was in July of 1954, and an event happened, which all of you are aware of, I'm sure, that changed music for all time. Music would never be the same after this night in 1954. Sam Phillips walked in with an acetate, wasn't even a recording yet. It didn't have a B-side yet. It wouldn't be recorded till the following Thursday, Blue Moon in Kentucky. But that night he came in with this acetate, uh, a test pressing of That's All Right Mama by this truck driving singer for Crown Electric Company. He put it on the turntable and the switchboard lit up. Sam liked to use Dewey. They weren't related, although their name was Phillips. They weren't related, but Sam liked to go to Dewey and have him test a record, because if it made it on Dewey's show, he knew he had a hit. Switchboard lit up. I happened to be there that night, showing some friends of mine that I played high school football with in Jackson, Tennessee. They wanted to see WHBQ. We were on the mezzanine floor, which Dewey used to call the magazine floor, of the Chiska Hotel. And uh, they wanted to see the station. So I was showing them around, and I heard all this commotion. I went into Dewey's studio. I said, what's going on? He played it seven times in a row without stopping. People couldn't get enough of That's All Right, Mama. So Sam said, I've got his telephone number. You call, I was designated to call Gladys and Vernon to find out where Elvis was, because we wanted him to come to the station. So uh, I called, she answered. They were listening, and they were all excited. So said, well, he was so nervous about doing this. Uh, having his record played, he went to see a double feature at the Suzor's. That's where he is. So they got in the truck. They went all, They lived in Lauderdale Courts out in East Memphis, low rent housing. They got in the truck, went down to the Suzor's, walked up and down the dark aisles. Elvis sitting all by himself, whispered to him about the excitement being generated. They took him down to the WHBQ. I met him that night, and God bless him. He became my friend for the rest of his mortal life. That's kind of the way it was in Memphis. And from there, from That's All Right Mama in 54, through Blackboard Jungle, which gave us rock around the clock, there on with the Everly Brothers and Sam Cooke and all of it, by 1959, music had changed forever. Very few Patty Page records anymore <laughs> that made it, or Joe Stafford. But that's the way it was. That's the way it was in Memphis in the 50s. And little did you know at that time, and Elvis knew that there were four young kids in Liverpool, England listening to those records. Who would that be? That would be, um, <laughs> well, one of them was Pete Best, but things didn't work out well for him. <laughs> but no, the music of 706 Union Avenue influenced the world. And tonight, we're going to recreate what it must have been like to be at 706 Union Avenue, the home of Sun Studio. We would like to dedicate tonight to Sam Phillips. Yeah. So, in honor of Mr. Sam, I present to you, um, and thank, let's thank Winky Wink Mindell. <laughs>